Welcome to the American Antiquarian Society's virtual program, Book Madness with Denise Gigante. We're coming to you from the ancestral homelands of the Nipmuc tribal community who remain an active presence here in central Massachusetts. I am Nan Wolverton, Vice President for Programs at the Society. Our mission at AAS is to cultivate a deeper understanding of the American past grounded in the primary sources that we've been collecting since 1812. In addition to welcoming researchers from around the world to use the collections, both physical and digital, we host programs like this evening's that feature the fruits of that research and provide insights into the past and its resonance for today. We thank everyone for joining us this evening, and as a nonprofit organization, we welcome any support that you can provide to help keep this work going, and thank you. I am joined behind the scenes by my colleague, Amanda Kondek, Programs Coordinator, who will post links and relevant information into the chat throughout the program. You can post questions at any point this evening into the Q&A function, um, and we'll get to your questions after the talk. The program is being recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel next week. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker. Denise Gigante is the Sadie Durnham Paedic Professor in the Humanities at Stanford University. Her interests include poetic form and aesthetics, 19th century bibliomania and literary antiquarianism, gastronomy or literature and food, the history and genre of the literary essay, and relations between William Blake's poetry and visual culture, which I believe is the subject of her next book. Denise is in fact the author of six books, including The Keats Brothers, The Story of John and George, which was published by Yale University Press in 2011. And most recently, she is the author of Book Madness, A Story of Book Collectors in America, also published by Yale this year. She will be speaking to us tonight about her book, Book Madness. Denise, please go ahead. Uh, Denise, you will need to unmute. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, you can hear me now. Okay. Well, I'm delighted to see everybody. Uh, I will now um, share my screen. I'm going to be talking about, one second. Let me get this up here. Let's see. Okay, so what I wanted to talk to you about by way of uh, uh, my book, as an excuse really, <laughs> is the relation between bibliography, bibliomania, and bibliophilia, largely in the mid 19th century, uh, which was a period when um, uh, the phenomenon known as bibliomania, this, this frenzy for collecting books and building libraries in Britain, largely private libraries, uh, came to America in the 1830s and 40s. And this is the time when most of the major collections that are now in institutional libraries were formed. Uh, it was largely uh, an effort based on antiquarian books because a lot of the nation's history that people were interested in collecting, for example, or, or the history of the Americas more broadly speaking, uh, was in old books old books and manuscripts and materials. So historical societies were cropping up in the 1840s. And of course the American Antiquarian Society was a part of that same uh, learned society culture. So my book um, focuses on these different kinds of collecting in the mid 19th century in America by way of the dispersal of Charles Lamb's library in 1848 in New York. Uh, Lamb, is known as the patron saint of book collectors. Um, Lamb is an essayist and his essays uh, really exude the kind of book love that many of his uh, readers could identify with. And he became a model in the United States for working men of letters who had to work for a living, worked in a counting house, worked as an attorney, but spent all of their time with books outside of that. And Lamb, who worked in the British uh, East India Company, was a good model for how it was possible to keep up a spiritual life or an intellectual life outside the margins of commercial necessity. Uh, so, so Lamb was huge uh, in America in the mid-19th century. And if you take a look at this catalog, uh, 
uh, by the New York auctioneers, Cooley, Keys, and Hill, who resold part of his library later in the year in 1848. Um, you'll see that this is a massive uh, collection, this private library, but one of the collectors who bought about a third of Lamb's library when it was sold in 1848. And What's it, what I wanted to point out is that this is typical of sale catalogs at the time. No matter how many valuable books were in a book collection, if there were any books in that collection that had been owned by Charles Lamb, they were featured on the front page. And here we have, you know, a list of uh, antiquarian books, very pricey, uh, very nicely bound books. But yet in the middle of it, in bold, are 18 volumes from the library of Charles Lamb. So we ask, why is that? And again, this isn't an isolated instance. This was universal in, in, in 19th century book auction catalogs in this country. I've, I've, I've done a survey. Uh, Lamb was just beloved. People wanted to get their hands on books that he had owned, even if they were very, very ragged and torn apart. Um, so again, just going back to this from this section here, um, you can see that in this collection, for example, was a copy of um, the Bibliographical Decameron by the bibliographer Thomas Frognall Dibden, lavishly, expensively produced volumes, um, the, uh, a copy of Hollinshead's Chronicles. This was the book used by, relied on by Shakespeare in developing a number of his plays. A uh, very hard book to come by, and The Complete Angler, which was another favorite from the 17th century. And yet, <laughs> these were the books that, that, that drew all the attention. This is Lamb's copy of John Donne's Poems, which is now in the Beinecke Library at Yale University. Um, you can see what a horrible condition it's in, and this is one of the better ones, if you can believe it. Even the title page, was not, this is not an original title page. This has been pasted into the book from another copy. Um, this is the same book. Again, the spine is peeling, the covers are detached and it's full of scribbling like this. This is Samuel Taylor Coleridge's commentary on Dunn's poems. And this is what made it valuable. This is the kind of thing that book collectors look for in an association copy that draws them closer to the former owner. So even though the book wasn't worth much in a market sense, it was worth a ton in, it had a ton of sentimental value. And ultimately the two came together in the 19th century. Um, there was a whole category of what were known as autographomaniacs who collected autograph marginalia letters and other things that they felt uh, was the most direct way to put them in touch with another um, with another presence inside the book besides the author. And again, this is this is Dunn's book, but you see now we now it's at Yale University Library. And wretched as it is, I can assure you, probably none of us could afford this book. Okay, so now I want to think about Lamb as a uh, touch point, touchstone for a tradition of bibliographical writing that began, began in the early 19th century and started to involve the personal, the personal experience with the book uh, that really wasn't there before in the 18th century. Bibli bibliographical writing before that time uh, was about the book. Uh, which copy it was, which issue, which edition, uh, which binding, uh, what special woodcuts were in it, et cetera. But in the Romantic period, which again is say 18 teens through the 1820s in this particular case for bibliography, uh, it really exploded with a kind of personal writing about books. So now we're turning to bibliography. And if we think about the English tradition, Really, uh, Richard de Bury, who is a medieval bibliomaniac, uh, produced a collection of 20 essays in 1345, uh, which talk about, in, in effect, book love, book obsession, et cetera. But it's a very, very um, uh, uh, 
objective in a sense. Well, it's subjective, but it doesn't really involve DeBerry's own personal reading experiences in the way that um, the romantic bibliograph bibliographical uh, movement did. So here's a quotation from one of Lamb's best loved essays by book lovers. It's called Detached Thoughts on Books and Writing. And it begins to pave the way for later collectors, uh, Walter Pater, uh, Thackeray and, and others uh, to start thinking about what it is that makes a specific copy of a book essential to that text. Um, and Lamb had all sorts of opinions about this, articulated them in an incredibly um, witty and eloquent manner. And again, that became a model for many American book collectors who, who tried to do the same thing in essay form. So for example, um, writing about um, <clears throat> James Thompson's The Seasons, uh, which is a, a four book, uh, book length poem about nature, about the seasons, Lamb says, to be strong-backed, well, in general, to be strong-backed and neat-bound is the desideratum of a volume, right? You don't want it falling apart on your shelf. This, when it can be afforded, is not to be lavished upon all kinds of books indiscriminately. I would not dress a set of magazines, for instance, in full suit. The dishabille or half-binding with Russia backs ever is our costume. Um, he says, he goes on to say that the seasons he prefers to have a little bit dog-eared and crumpled. And you can see how the sense of being well worn in would fit in with that comfy sense of reading in a sense about nature. This is the first major uh, sort of proto-romantic uh, poem in English in that it focused on the spe specificity of nature as being important in and of itself. So it was a kind of cozy reading and 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 Lamb talks about how it really uh, shouldn't be too um, lavish. A Shakespeare, he says, or a Milton, unless the first edition, which would be the first folio, uh, it were mere foppery to trick out in gay apparel. The possession of them confers no distinction, right? Because everybody loves Shakespeare. The exterior of them, the things themselves being so common, strange to say, raises no sweet emotions, no tickling sense of property in the owner. Um, Thompson Seasons, again, looks best, I maintain it, a little torn and dog's-eared. So he, the edition of Shakespeare that Lamb talked about liking best was the common everyman edition. Um, the Thompson and Rowe edition from 1709 is the first year of its publication. It's a little bit like today's Shakespeare, you know, signet paperbacks or something. Uh, common, affordable, uh, collected editions of the work uh, that did not lavish too much money about, upon the illustrations. And that, he said, suited the reading of Shakespeare, who was the poet of nature, uh, every man's poet, the best. So this to him would look ridiculous. This is Shakespeare bound up with gilt edged leaves, uh, gilt, uh, gilt bindings, fine Morocco leather, etc. <clears throat> and he says, in fact, the more that, uh, the better a book is, the little, the less it demands from binding. Um, and lastly, just to take one last example of how to fit the book to the, to the material, um, he talks about the novel, Henry, uh, The History of Tom Jones, which most schoolboys uh, would read in grammar school. And he says, to the genuine lover of reading, the sullied leaves and worn out appearance, nay, the very odor beyond Russia, if we could not, Russia leather, if we could not forget kind feelings and fastidiousness and of an old circulating library, Tom Jones or Vicar of Wakefield. And this would be the first edition of Tom Jones, which um, doubled pretty much the typical um, uh, volume count of a novel. Um, in the Romantic period, it was only three. But what this allowed for dividing the novel into different volumes was that while one person books were so expensive, that one person could borrow the first volume and another could borrow the second and another could borrow the third. 
as they moved along in the cycle, and this gave greater access of the book to more people. However, it was also a democratizing function that made people feel like they were part and parcel of, of, of a certain kind of group reading the same novel. And that's what Lamb says is the best way to, to read Tom Jones. Um, and he speaks here of the, uh, the needle, like his sister, the needle, the seamstress, who after a long, hard day's work, um, ends up sitting down and curling up with this book. And so when Lamb reads it, he has a sense of association or connection with her too. And then lastly, in terms of quotations from Lamb, uh, I wanted to point to this, this quotation where he says, not everything that is dressed up like a book actually is a book, right? So he defines books which are no books or biblia a biblia as he calls it. Um, and in, in that category, he puts court calendars, directories, pocket books, draft boards, bound and lettered at the back, notebooks, scientific treatises, almanacs, statutes, or legal books, the works of Hume, Gibbon, Robertson, Beatty, Soam James, and generally all those volumes which, quote, no gentleman's library should be without. And you can recognize the language of advertising here appealing to the middle class um, reader who may or may not have been a reader, but who certainly wanted books on their prep private library at home to, to add to their cultural status. And that's what Lamb is kind of bristling against, this idea that those people who had real relations to books didn't need all the books on the shelf to look alike in, in leather binding. Um, and, you know, these are very popular writers of the day, uh, moral philosophers, uh, historians, but to Lamb exceedingly dry. Um, he says, it can, it, I confess that it moves my spleen to see these things in books clothing perched upon shelves like false saints, usurpers of true shrines, intruders into the sanctuary, rusting out the legitimate occupants. And this phrase, Biblia Biblia, or books which are no books, was adopted in the mid-1840s in, in, mid in America um, as the motto for what was probably the most um, influential uh, uh, publisher series of classics, what we today call classics. And the title for that series or, or the motto was books which are books, <laughs> well-chosen books. And most people who write about that today assume that that is just a tautology. Books, <laughs> that doesn't mean anything, books which are books, but it's a direct reference back to Lamb. Okay, now I wanna set uh, Lamb and his fellow essayists as bibliophiles who we'll come back to at the end uh, against the tradition of bibliographical writing uh, by the father of bibliography, father of English bibliography, Thomas Frognall Dibden. Um, Dibden could not really afford to be a bibliomaniac himself, although he had bibliomaniacal tendencies, um, but he attached himself to aristocratic collectors, such as Earl Spencer, who had major, uh, or Thomas Grenville, who had major collections. And through his work as bibliographers for those great libraries, um, he was able to produce a whole slew <laughs> of, of bibliographical works that were not just accurate, or I don't know how accurate they were, but they were, they were hard bibliography at the same time as they allowed for a literary element to creep into it. And therefore they were extremely entertaining. Um, Dibden was also the popularizer of the phenomenon known as bibliomania. Uh, he wasn't the first to use the word, but this book of 1809 was the book that really kind of uh, codified uh, bibliomania as, as a cultural event of the 18, early, early half of the 18th, uh, 19th century. Um, this is his title page, Bibliomania of the First Edition, or Book Madness, 
containing some account of the history, symptoms, and cure of this fatal disease. Um, and you can see here that he has included a woodcut, which is a detail of Albrecht Durer's woodcut for uh, a book, a 16th century book known as the Book of Fools. Um, and this is the book fool. And the book fool is somebody who spends his time keeping his books clean, admiring their bindings, their paper quality, their drawings, uh, their miniatures, and has no idea what they're about or what's in them. And the quotation here, still I am busy books assembling, for to have plenty is a pleasant thing in my conceit, and to have them always in books. But what they mean, I do not understand. So I and Hans, I do not understand. Um, this is a direct quotation from the Ship of Fools, characterizing the book Fool. Um, and what's interesting here is that <laughs> there's an inside joke because he doesn't credit the author, which was Sebastian Brandt of this verse, nor does he credit the um, translator of this edition. He credits the printer. It's, this is Pinson's Ship of Fools. And it's the, the, uh, the 1509 edition. Uh, so you can see that, and he puts Pinson in black letter type, the kind of black letter type that was used in early, in books of early printing. So it's a kind of wink to the reader that, that the book uh, bibliomaniac or the book lover may be a fool, but I'm, I'm one of them. This is a kind of playful foolery uh, much like Shakespearean foolery um, that has all sorts of wisdom in it. And the fool here um, became, the, gave its name to fool's cap, right? So the fool's cap was folio size paper and the watermark of the earliest um, paper um, had the book fool. As it's, as it's marking. So all the way from the beginning, the book fool was associated with the physical properties of books and judging their value according to their physical properties. Um, you can see here that it's dedicated to Richard Heber, Esquire, uh, the book. And Heber was the, the great whale of bibliomaniacs. He was the ur-bibliomaniac. Um, he was the fiercest and strongest, as the poet Thomas Campbell calls him, of the bibliomaniacs. And this is Heber here. Heber uh, uh, did never settled for one copy of a book. If he could help himself, he would have three. And he says, he explained that no man can comfortably do without three because he must have his show copy. Another he will require for his own uh, reference. And unless he's inclined to part with this one, which is very inconvenient or risk injury to it, he must needs have a third at the service of his friends. And we'll turn in a second to James Lennox, who is the American version of uh, Heber. Uh, but you know, these were men whose homes were so full of books that it was easier to buy another to lend to a friend than it was to find any particular copy they might have because they were typically so busy <clears throat> accumulating books that they did not have time to catalog or organize in any kind of way those books. Um, Heather filled not just one house with books, but nine houses with books. So this is his ancestral property, Hodnett Hall, where he had a good number of books in his collection. This is Hodnett in Shropshire. He had a house on York Street in Westminster and one in Pimlico in London. He had a house in Paris, Louvain, Leiden, The Hague, Brussels, and Antwerp. Because the kind of antiquarian collecting uh, that he was doing um, involved different languages and different book centers in continental Europe. So it was e easier to just rent houses there to keep all of his books. And here's Dibdin, again, the bibliographer's description of seeing um, uh, Heber's library in Pimlico for the first time. 
He says, I had never seen, and this was after 15 years acquaintance, Heber had never, never let him in the house. I had never seen rooms, cupboards, passages, and corridors so choked, so suffocated with books. Treble rows were here, double rows were there, hundreds of slim quartos, several upon each other, were longitudinally placed over thin and stunted duos decimos, reaching up from one extremity of a shelf to another, up to the very ceiling, to the, pi the piles of volumes extended, while the floor was strewed with them in loose and numerous heaps. Um, so, you know, the, the, the strange thing about the Heber collection is that when Heber died in 1833, he left no record of what he wanted to happen to these books. Um, his attorneys looked everywhere. They went, to, they dispatched agents to all of his houses. They, they turned the houses inside out looking for the will and they couldn't find one. Dibden one day was cataloging the, sh the books on the shelf in, in Heber's bedroom and up there on the top, on the top row, maybe second, uh, third row back, he found this little uh, kind of dirty piece of paper, which had bequeathed some money to some relatives and made no mention whatsoever of all of the books. So this collection went to the hammer and flooded the market. Um, let's see where I am in terms of time. Okay, uh, Heber was not the first bibliomaniac in the English tradition. Thomas Rawlinson preceded him in the 18th century, although Rawlinson filled just one house with books. Um, and Tom William Olds, who is a, in, in his work, a literary antiquary says that if Rawlinson's purse had been much wider, he always wanted more. He had a passion beyond it. Such a pitch of curiosity or dotage he was arrived at upon a different edition, a fairer copy, a larger paper than 20 of the same sort he might have already possessed. And as he lived, so he died in his bundles, piles, and bulwarks of paper in dust and cobwebs at London House in Aldersgate Street. And this is Aldersgate Street, which leads to um, St. Paul's and the center, really, of the book district. Um, the, okay. The nickname Thomas Rawlinson gained the nickname Tom Folio. And this is from his auction catalog. Again, another uh, selection of choice, which began, uh, this is the thing I wanted to point out. It began on uh, October 17, 1722 in one of the coffee houses, right? The coffee house by St. Paul's. Uh, St. Paul's Coffee House, which is where the early auctions were held. And it was still going 16 years later, this sale. Um, so, okay. Joseph Addison in the Spectator caricatures the Tom Folio character um, as a broker in learning, somebody who knows, again, little about books, but everything about title pages manuscripts in which they were discovered, editions through which they have passed, the praises or censures they have received from different members of the learned world. And he has greater esteem for Aldous and Elsevier than for Virgil and Horace. So again, printers trump authors. If you talk of Herodotus, he breaks out into panegyric upon Harry Stevens, who was another printer, in this case, a French printer. He thinks he gives you an account of the author when he tells the subject he treats of, the name of the editor and the year in which it was printed. Or if you draw him into further particulars, he cries up the goodness of the paper, extols the diligence of the corrector and is transported with the beauty of the letter. And Addison in his effort to culture a polite literary readership, what he called polite literature, felt that this kind of um, technical book knowledge was counter to the cause of literature. It was for him a form of pedantry. Um, and those who could talk knowledgeably about books um, spoke their own kind of technical language that was not um, appropriate for a general mixed audience. And in this case, a mixed audience would include women, right? So a polite audience. And a polite audience wanted to talk about literature not about bindings. 
Okay. Uh, this is the cover from The Ship of Fools. And I just wanted to point out that The Ship of Fools is, this is a kind of age old metaphor for the ship of state, right? And it takes all different kinds of fools to make up a state, political fools, um, you know, architectural fools. And so the book fool is one of that party. This is Pinson, Pinson's edition. This is the um, printer to Henry VII and Henry VIII. This is uh, one of the printers that Addison refers to who invented italic type. And Pinson was known for introducing into English printing the Roman type. So this is the Roman type that we're used to seeing. Um, but you can see in, the in his edition of the Ship of Fools, he's still also using black letter. These are the three major types of um, type. This was invented by, again, uh, the Italians, the Italic, the Roman, and the black letter. And here, Dibdin plays with all that by drawing in black letter to the book Net Madness because bibliomaniacs uh, at this point in time were still obsessed with antiquarian books, which for them meant the earliest printed books possible. For American bibliomaniacs and collectors, that was also the case, sort of, uh, although um, it was much, much harder to buy early books in the US. Collectors would have to send agents to London to do that or to Paris. It became exceedingly expensive. So the equivalent of um, book collectors in the US uh, tended to look for categories where they could um, develop expertise, um, and, uh, typically books that began in the 17th century. And again, typically books about America, which were less wanted in the European context. This is the 18, this is 1809, this is 1811, two years later, Dibden reconceptualizes the bibliomania as a bibliographical romance. So it turns from being a kind of um, a pathological parody to something that um, can be made more literary as a type of quest. And this image now no longer features a book fool, but the inside of the Bodleian um, Library in Oxford. And you can see that this is one of the oldest libraries in Britain and therefore had among the greatest accumulation of books. By 1842, um, the bibliographical romance no longer even shows any books on the cover, right? It's now literally a kind of uh, romance with music here um, as these, uh, uh, sort of early modern dressed figures uh, paddle along, presumably talking about literature rather than book bindings. And if you look, even the nature of the pile of books changes from this rude kind of woodcut to a much more polished version of really expensive looking old books. So again, by 1842, the bibliomania had become a kind of elite um, middle-class um, practice. In the 1830s, things started to shift. Uh, the market was flooded and book prices dropped and Bib um, Dibden published the Bibliophobia instead of the Bibliomania. And instead of addressing it to Richard Heber, a bibliomaniac, he addressed it to, um, uh, so let's just, Bibliophobia remarks on the present languid and depressed state of literature in the book trade in a letter directed to the author of Bibliomania. So this is a self-directed parody and you can see how bibliography has become this really playful genre, this really um, almost like movie script writing today, tons of inside jokes, uh, very self-conscious, etc. Now you shift across the Atlantic and the bibliomania gets going there in the 1830s. And I have here 1839, the bibliomaniac George Templeton Strong, who was a New Yorker, a diarist, 
say New York is certainly infected with the bibliomania. I never saw anything like the eagerness to buy and the prices given. Um, okay, so I kind of wanna come back now to the essayists in order to round things up. Um, and I wanna shift from, have us hold up, almost juxtapose the kind of bibliographical writing that Dibden was doing with the kind of bibliographical writing that Lamb and his other familiar essays were doing. So if you look here at Dibden's career, and this these aren't all of his works, but these are some of his, a lot of his works. It starts with a very, very technical book, a specimen of uh, a Brit British library, which is basically a survey of old books in Britain. Uh, which Dibden had updated from an earlier bibliographer. He took over a kind of unfinished edition. He started it in 1808 and he worked on it for quite a while. And it was basically a bibli, it was a strict bibliography describing books. Um, then there's the bibliomania, which breaks him out a little bit. Typographical antiquities is in the earlier genre. Book rarities is another descriptive catalog. Bibliography of poem becomes more literary. Um, then we have the Bibliotheca Spenceriana, five volumes describing the Althorpe Library, Earl Spencer. This is a, a playful dialogue. This is on one of the books in Earl Spencer's library. It's focused on the um, what's known as the Waldorfer Decameron, which is the book whose sale in 1812, the Roxburgh Library of London, uh, sorry, the Roxburgh Club was, was founded to commemorate. This was the most expensive book in the world for, for 60 years uh, from 1812 when it was sold. And then we move into kind of other playful adaptations of bibliographical writing in say the picturesque tour. Um, here of France and Germany, um, here of Althorpe, another book on Althorpe, The Literary Companion or A Young Man's Guide and the Old Man's Comfort in the Choice of a Library, uh, Reminiscences of a li Literary Life, A Bibliographical Antiquarian Tour, etc. And this category of the reminiscences of a literary life um, is very much something of the age also. So if you think of say Coleridge's Bibliographia Literaria, right? Reviewing his life through the lens of the of the books that he's read or a essay by uh, William Hazlitt on reading old books. There's a way in which one's identity at the time was conceptualized as um, a, a series of, of reading experiences. And these are really the the essayists whose bibliographical writings uh, were, were best known in the US at the time, Lamb, Hazlitt, Lee Hunt. And I've just listed here some of their <clears throat> essays, well-loved by bibliophiles and imitated. And here's Hunt. If there be one word in our language beyond all others, teeming with delightful associations, books is that word. And now we're kind of ending on the association um, concept here, because what was so special about old books, and particularly those in Lamb's library or other books known as association copies, was the associations they enabled, not just again with authors, but with reading experience that they shared with others. And this is worth quoting at length from, from Hazlitt's on reading old books, because it's a wonderful lyrical passage about what reading an old book enables that reading a new book, hot off the press does not. And he says, when he reads an old book, not only are the old ideas of the contents of the work brought back to my mind and all their vividness, but the old associations of the faces and persons of those I then knew as they were in their lifetime, the place where I sat to read the volume, the day when I got it, the feeling of the air, the fields, the sky return and all my early impressions with them. This is better to me, those places, those times, those persons, and those feelings that come across me as I retrace the story and devour the page are to me better far than the wet sheets of the last new novels. I not only have the pleasure of imagination and of a critical relish of the work, 
but the pleasures of memory added to it. It recalls the same feelings and associations which I had in first reading it, and which I can never have again in any other way. Standard productions of this kind are links in the chain of our conscious being. They bind together the different scattered divisions of our personal identity. They are landmarks and guides in our journey through life. They are pegs and loops on which we can hang up or from which we take down at pleasure, the wardrobe of a moral imagination. And so you can see here that one of the nature of associations is internal. It's these, it's it's the it's the mental and emotional and imaginative associations we have in reading a book with our earlier selves, with people we knew. And particularly, I think it's implied here, although it's not stated directly, with our childhood selves, our imaginative selves, right? That are lost, that become lost in the adult. And the association copy is what my book is based on. It's the 60 copies from Lamb's library, again, that were sold. I tell the story of how that happened in the book. Um, but you can see here, one of the association copies from that library having been rebound to boast. So a, a New York millionaire bought this book, Ogden Golit, and rebound it, you know, fixed it up, had this really um, uh, gorgeous uh, gilt paneling added to the spine. But what stands out is that where you typically have the author and the title and the date of publication at the center here is the fact that it was Charles Lamb's copy. It's the association value of this book that gives it its real value and makes it worth the rebinding. If you look inside of it, it probably looks like this, right? Because this was um, Lamb's copy of Cleveland's poems. Uh, he had two that were sold in New York in 1848. And this is the other one. And this owner who purchased it, um, who was the head of the American um, uh, uh, book company, didn't rebind it, right? He recognized that rebinding this book would diminish its value for what it was as a relic. And so instead he pastes in this very, very fancy book plate to give it that kind of upscale look, but really he leaves, he le and so really, if you wanna do it the right way, you make a nice leather case and you leave the book in all of its raggedness. And this is Doy um, the man of letters, Everett Augustus Doyking's description of the books when he saw them for sale for the first time on Broadway. Lamb's library was a literary hospital for all stages of book decrepitude. Yet there was virtue in the least of those old books, since, as I actually heard a grosser remark on his first sight of them, Ilya has actually had this book in his hands. Okay, I think I'm going to stop there. I think I've said enough, and we're at time, we're at 45, so let me stop my share. And, of course, I can keep going, but <clears throat> I won't. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. Thank you so much. What a what a great overview of of all things um, book wretched wretched conditions of books. I love it. <laughs> um, and let me just say that for all of our book consuming audience members, that the book behind Denise is is not a book. That is her her book is not gigantic. <laughs> um, this is the scale um, that is a poster, but it is a, a great a great cover. Um, thank you so much. I have a bunch of questions, but I'm going to uh, go right to some of the questions coming into the Q&A and the chat. So um, for all of the audience members, um, put any questions that you have into the Q&A. And that's where I will um, monitor them and um, read them out for Denise. So I'm going to start with a question from Diana Korsenik, who is asking about how you would characterize 18th century urban North American collectors' libraries. 18th century urban North American. As in Philadelphia, New York. Yeah. yeah. So, okay, so uh, so I know less about that period, but it used, so Philadelphia used to be the book capital of, of the country. Um, and then it shifted. And by the mid 19th century, it was, undoubtedly New York, but Boston was second. 
and then Philadelphia was third. Those were the book capitals. Um, they weren't the only place with book, important book collections. Um, you know, down in Georgia, you would have historical society collections and that kind of thing. Um, but but those were the main producing centers. So the difference was that in the 18th century, uh, the major uh, field of literary production was um, in theological and religious subjects. And, you know, that's that's true all the way through, really through this moment, through the 1830s and the 1840s is when the American secular literary tradition in and of its own, right, gets going. And it was people like Everett Doykink and his brother George and the editors and publishers in the literary world of New York who really worked hard to identify upcoming American writers such as Hawthorne and Melville. And I guess Irving really was among the first of them. Um, and, and Putnam, George Palmer Putnam um, published the first standard edition of, of Irving's work, and that was a big coup. But this all took place in the 1840s. So Doy King's father was one of the first printers in New York, and his name also was Everett. And he had a print shop in what was downtown Manhattan, and that was the book center around Broadway. And again, his, his sort of main field of production was in, in theological and, and uh, religious literature. So that shift took place in the next generation, um, as far as my understanding um, of it goes. And again, the kind of literary production that was taking place at the time in terms of writing about books in a witty way, writing about reading, um, Doikik founded The Literary World, which was the first major sort of it wasn't really a trade publication, but call it a literary trade publication. Um, you know, and then he was joined by uh, the Atlantic Monthly and other magazines that started to create a critical taste for not just imported books from Europe in, in the English tradition, but for American authors. Um, so I hope that's useful. Great. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, so here's a question from David Keene who asks, if a book contained the marginalia of a noted person or persons, how was this noted in bibliographies and sales catalogs? So, uh, so that's an important distinction. So you can have a book that contains marginalia or, or what have you from, from unknown persons or from persons who are known but who are not public figures. Um, and the association copy is defined as precisely that. It is the book formerly owned by a famous person, more or less. Um, how they were noted, uh, you know, uh, we saw the, um, uh, the, the cover of the auction catalog, copies or volumes from the library of um, uh, was one way to do it. Um, but the technical phrase for it was association copy. And later, say by the 1890s, uh, you started seeing that more in sales catalogs because sentimental collecting, and keep in mind, association copies, manuscripts, uh, literary relics of all sorts was part of the trend in sentimental collecting that was to a large degree an American invention. Um, that started in the mid 18th century, that continued to grow in popularity. And so that by the end of the century, you had, um, say, Henry Box Smith uh, writing, or Harry B. Smith, um, a sentimental library, or Charles W. Fredrickson, who collected uh, books with association value by the Romantic poets. And by the 1930s, this style of collecting, sentimental collecting, had become so popular that those books were now priced out of the market. Mm -hmm. um, and what you could have bought in, say, the 1890s had become six times the value, uh, at least. So, you know, from there we continue, but it, it, you know, it's, it's an American phenomenon also because the rare book as such wasn't really valued in a European context in which, you know, 
books had been accumulating in libraries since the beginning of printing. So, you know, the idea of a library like the Bodleian or the British Library and the British Museum was to stock everything, to accumulate an encyclopedic base of knowledge based on books and, you know, shelve them all together because they're all valuable. Whereas in the U.S., when this happened centuries later, uh, really, so for example, the largest library in the U.S., in the mid 19th century was Harvard's and that had 72,000 volumes. But the British library had close to uh, 500,000 volumes, half a million, it was closer to 470 something. Paris had about, had close to a million. It, the scale was utterly different. Um, and so what American libraries were able to do that British libraries weren't was to, um, set aside these, these special collections, these collections that included relics and old books related say to American history or what have you that had value in and of themselves as relics. And, and the British really dismissed that kind of sentimentalism until much later. Um, and I don't know if they ever really fully embraced it in the way that, uh, that the Americans did. I mean, you see somebody like Amy, you know, um, Lowell at, at, at Harvard, who collected Keats's early uh, manuscripts and works, that never really, I mean, the reason Lamb was so popular here was precisely his sentimental value, and he was out of favor in Britain <laughs> at this time. That's why his books wound up in America. He was not appreciated. They weren't appreciated. Nobody, his executor, Edward Moxon, the London publisher, tried to give them away. And uh, the University College of London just would not accept them. <laughs> so, you know, uh, it was it was a different mindset, really. And it remains in rare book libraries. The rare book is also, in that respect, a kind of American um, icon. Yeah, yeah. So um, here's a question from Daniel Couch. He's wondering how much of a class element you see in the distinctions of taste on the side of the polite reader less interested in bindings and elements of workmanship, was this a bid at separating themselves from the physical manual labor aspect of book creation? Uh, so, you know, what I would say about that is that uh, when you get middle-class collectors, uh, whether in the UK, which is the other side of my book, or, or the US, um, you're no longer at the Hebrew level, the aristocratic level of collecting that can be indiscriminate. You just buy Hebrew on one trip to Paris, bought a library of 30,000 volumes. That was well beyond Yale University's library collection in terms of size at the time. He just snapped it up. Middle-class collectors couldn't do that. And so elements of choice Come, come into the picture in a really crucial way. And so that's why you find so many titles of private library catalogs and sale catalogs in the 19th century saying a choice collection, right? F Edward Doiking named his, his, his publication series uh, the Library of Choice Reading um, because once you can no longer afford everything, the way to distinguish yourself is through what you choose to read, to put on your shelves, to accumulate. And you can really um, therefore see in, in private libraries, the identity, the personality of the collector represented. And if you don't see that in a, in a private library, you very often have a much more bland and uninteresting collection. And this was said over and over again, right? That what really set aside collectors from, particularly from the 1870s and beyond, when books really started in this country becoming expensive, um, was that they could find their own niche, you know? So again, if it's it's Fredrickson, it's Keats and Shelley, you know? Uh, but it could really be anything, it could be birds, but you can, you can show your taste and your personality and your identity through your library. Uh, in a way that, you know, aristocrats just never did. They were part of a kind of um, uh, class institution that mattered, 
it mattered less who they were inside than, than who they were in terms of their title mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and their responsibility to, say, a large library that they had inherited or something. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting to think about the book collecting um, to, to, to compare to China Mania, which was also happening in the 19th century, um, which, I, which, which I think of as being more sort of middle class. But the class question is, a, and I think it's an intriguing one. Um, Matthew Bogan is asking, and, and actually, thank you for reminding us that book collectors often collect despite their lack of funds. What lessons, and this brings us up to the present day, what lessons should 21st century collectors learn from the foibles or mistakes of 19th century bibliomaniacs? So who's asking that? This is Matthew Bogan. Okay, so uh, so current collectors, what can they learn from the experience of their former? Okay, um, you know, the bibliomaniacs uh, who sort of lost sleep um, marking catalogs, et cetera, et cetera. In order to be able to devote that kind of um, energy and time to books, uh, however, whatever your relation to them was, uh, that pressed back against family. So a lot of these book collectors were unmarried and you can see good reasons why why that was. Um, Economic demands, uh, you know, come along also with a family. Demands for a private identity as much as a public, you know, uh, to some degree, these bibliomaniacs had a public identity in that they were part of a book world um, and they knew each other. And this was a a version of academia today, probably. Um, But but there were very, there are very few women in the story. I mean, there's a way in which if the women enter my story, they're there as wives supporting their husbands. if their husband buys a book, it's his book, right? Even if they share the library. So I would say that 21st century collectors are faced with gender issues in a way that um, earlier ones weren't. And I don't know what kind of an answer that is, but that's that's one, I would say that's one big difference. Yeah. It might not be a difference in that for all I know, among contemporary collectors, <clears throat> there are more men than women. It has always been a kind of clerical, um, <clears throat> you know, obsessive uh, sort of erudite uh, es- escapism. Um, and of course, women can share that too. But I think the ones who do tend up to wind up in academia, whereas book collecting, um, I don't know. It's 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 distinct from academia in so far as academia is on the professional side of things. You do it to earn a living. It's your job. Whereas collecting is seen as an amateur occupation in in the good sense of amateur being a, a lover, somebody who does it for the passion of doing it. Um, and I guess that's more closely associated to leisure. Um, so, you know, it's an open question. It would yeah. be interesting to discuss. So we are just about out of time. And let me ask very quickly, there's just a couple of questions left. So um, can you quickly address um, whether um, there were any non-English influences? Did French bibliophilia, for example, have any influence on um, American collectors of this period? You know, that would be a really interesting research project that I haven't done. So I would say yes. For example, in the South, there's a collector named Alexander Smets, you know, whose library was much more um, uh, multilingual. Although the major collectors that I'm talking about did recognize uh, that, for example, if you're going to study the Americas, you need to be able to read Portuguese. You need to read Spanish. You need to read other language, French. Um, and so many of the historians uh, fell into that category. Uh, uh, and that would probably be a good place to begin that kind of research. Um, and also I would say in particular with the historical societies of the South, because the ones that were in New England, in the Northeast, tended to focus on early British colonial history, the history of New England, the settlements, the pilgrims, um, 
and that kind of thing. Whereas elsewhere in the country, that was less, you know, all consuming. Okay, thank you. So one last question and just then we'll wrap up. So when did books about bibliomania become collectible and eventually quite valuable themselves? You know, almost from the beginning. Um, so one of the bibliomaniacs in my story uh, who ended up uh, meeting Dibden in 1845 when he went for the first and last time to, to England, to the UK, um, owned 18 different Dibden editions, maybe more. Um, he spent a good amount of money on those. And the only other person in my book who did was his best friend, Thomas Douse, whose library is now at the Massachusetts Historical Society. And that's the Douse Library of the Massachusetts Historical Society. Um, you know, again, it's part of the question of choice and taste. So if you were a middle-class collector who had a taste for literary bibliography, in other words, you weren't necessarily doing historical research that needed uh, hardcore bibliography in, uh, in a particular area, if you were interested as a general reader in literary bibliography, uh, then you might well choose uh, to have a, a collection of Dibden. But from the very beginning, they were, um, they were expensive. There were American editions of him, but you know those books were made as collectibles. They were intended as collectibles. Um, yeah. Right. Okay, well, and just a final comment from Cheryl Thurber, who noticed um, that many of the bibliographic societies were all male for many years and did not admit women until gradually in the 1950s. And that's just in response to your comment about singer, single collectors. Uh, well, you so know, even places like the Athenaeum in Boston, you know, I mean, it was the, it was the male who, who was the head of household, who was the member, and then his family all had borrowing privileges, et cetera. But, they weren't members. Right, right, right. Well, Denise, thank you. This has been really enjoyable and, and very informative. We really appreciate your sharing your work with us. And thank you, all of you, for, for joining us. I'm just going to um, say a brief, uh, just a few words about some upcoming programs, just so you have them on your radar. So um, on November 10th, we have a program here at the Society, a, a hybrid program um, with David Godin. Um, five decades in the life of an independent publisher. Hope you can join us either in person or virtually for that. And on no November 17th, we have two programs, a virtual book talk in the afternoon at 2 p.m. with Marcy Denius's new book, The Textual Effects of David Walker's Appeal. Um, and then at 7 p.m. that same day, we have a hybrid program, Black Women Poets Respond to the Brown Family Archive. Um, which will be local poets um, who found inspiration in the Brown family collections here at AAS. So you can go to our website to learn more about all of those programs and to register for those programs. Thank you all for joining us again. And thank you, Denise. We really appreciate your time. This is great. Thank you. Good night, everyone. <laughs>